have to say it's definitely easier for me to be climbing Mount Everest than standing here talking to you all about it. Um, but I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my year of climbing the Seven Summits and some of the lessons that I learned along the way. Is there any volume? Uh, volume, volume, volume. Some will succeed, most will fail, seven will die. I think it might need to be a bit louder. I know, you'll get the gist. Um, this picture is taken in 1929, and it is of my, it was, of my grandmother. Um, one of the first Western women in the Himalayas. She worked for a British climber called Sir Hugh Rutledge. And you just have to think about that, 1929. I mean, that was around the time when Mallory and Irvine were trying to climb Everest. There were no maps. It took three months by ship just to get there. Um, I mean, if you could see the picture, um, the clothes that they wore. <laughs> that was me. Um, uh, hello, where's my picture? Um, <laughs> um, it made me feel really sport, sort of in the down and Gore-Tex that I'm, I wore today. So... It was such a stigma for a woman to do something like that back then that when she got back to England, my grandfather forbade her from ever talking about her trip to the Himalayas. He made her throw away her crampons, her ice axe, her snow leopard skin and it, that was given to her as a guest of honor by the villagers. And it remained this dark secret for years. Um, that was until my mother discovered the photographs when I was a teenager and I remember looking at these pictures of Granny, <laughs> Granny on the top of a mountain, and I remember thinking, wow, she is really cool. I want to do that. And in my mind, my grandmother is one of the pioneers of adventure travel, something I'm a big advocator of today. When I went to Everest, I was one of 12 women from both North and South, and there was probably 300 men. So for all you skeptics out there, there is no false summit that the women go to. There are no ladies' tees like you have in golf or best of three sets instead of five sets like you have in tennis. We do step for step the same as the men. And if we want stuff carried between camps, we carry it. Chivalry doesn't exist in the mountains. No guy's going, oh, Bells, can I carry your 40-pound pack for you? We are all in our own personal struggle of survival. And, you know, the funny thing about climbing is although you're climbing as part of a team, it's very, very much an individual experience. Take every opportunity that comes your way. That is literally my mantra. And my Everest opportunity was one of those moments. And it literally went like this. My mum and dad were at a bank function in London. And dad said to mum, you know, go and talk to that guy over there. He's a climber. So mum goes up to Andronico Luxic of Chile and she's like, I hear you're a climber. My daughter's a really good climber. So slightly taken aback, Andronico splutters out, would she like to join the Chilean 204 Everest expedition? And mum's like, she'd love that. And literally, what started as a joke, I took seriously. I got on the phone to Andronico Luxic in Chile, and I'm like, it's my dream to climb Everest. And, you know, slightly backpedaling, he's like, you need to come to Ecuador, meet the Chilean team, and climb two 20,000 foot peaks in a week. Unbeknownst to me, the Chilean teams were really unhappy that a business associate's daughter had been invited along their trip. So they had immediate plans to ditch the gringa. Now, I went rather stupidly from San Tropez to Ecuador, where I'd been burning the candle a bit at both ends. And um, pretty, pretty shortly after my arrival on Chimborazo, I came down with horrendous bronchitis. I couldn't, I mean, I coughed and coughed. But I knew that if I was going to get on that Everest trip, I had to climb these two peaks. So I coughed my way to both summits. I scarred my lungs for life in the process. They still show up on x-rays today. But I got on that Everest expedition. And that was the mentality that you need to take you to your goal. I then went on and climbed another six 20,000 foot peaks with the Chilean team. So that by the time I went for Everest, I'd climbed eight peaks above 20,000 feet. And I completely credit my Chilean team for getting me ready to climb Mount Everest. Now, let's hope this works. Everest is the tallest mountain in the world. This is picture was taken of my team through the Kumbu Icefall. Elbrus in Russia, it's at 18,000 feet. It's the highest mountain for Europe. 
Kilimanjaro in Africa, an extinct volcano that rises majestically out of the game plains of Kenya and Tanzania. <coughs> Kosciuszko in Australia, the easiest of the seven summits by far and of an altitude lower than Aspen, Colorado. The girls spice things up by, uh, down under by scaling the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Vincent in Antarctica, the most remote of the seven summits and a logistical nightmare to get to. We flew five hours south, south landing on the ice at Patriot Hills. I don't know what you think of when you think of a plane that lands on the ice, but I was in shock when I saw this Russian Illusion 76, the size of a jumbo jet. Um, that was it. I managed to sit in the cone. Um, Patriot Hills. And this is the base camp of Vincent. And I didn't really like to think about what would happen if something went wrong down there. Oh, me digging the boys' camps, as always. Um, Aconcagua, known for its high winds and violent storms, this mountain tested my physical limits to the max and sent me straight to hospital for frostbite. Denali in Alaska, some say the coldest of the seven summits, and I came away from this mountain learning a very important lesson. So lots of people ask me, you know, what was the scariest thing? What, what was, when did you, did you ever think you were going to die on the mountains? Well, there were lots of terrifying split-second moments that happened along the way. But where I had the real problem was on Aconcagua. You know, with mountain climbing, accidents you know, don't, aren't always the dramatic way in which one sort of goes. It normally is something sort of more benign, like uh, misjudging your physical limits. Most climbers die on the descent because they're so tired, and that's where all the mistakes happen. And for me, it was Aconcagua. I went to that mountain feeling pretty confident because I've climbed it before. Never, ever go to a mountain feeling confident. The mountain has amazing ways of humbling you, as I was about to find out. Um, my plan was we would ride in by mule three nine-hour days in the saddle, which my guides actually, at first, were very unhappy about. And secondly, um, they said it was almost as dangerous as the climb, which they actually got proved right on that. Um, then we would go base camp, camp one, camp two, summit, and out. I don't know if any of you have climbed Aconcagua before, but the last time I was there, I was on the mountain 13 days. I was now about to do it in four. So mule dramas aside, which we had, the first proper drama happened at Camp 1. My cameraman came down with very bad altitude sickness and had to go back to uh, uh, base camp. I went on to Camp 2, and just outside of 20,000 feet, I just thought, I'm going to pass out. And my guide, Luis, looked at me and he said, Annabelle, your lips have turned blue from lack of oxygen and I'm turning you around. And the thought of being turned around at this point in time was just too much for me. So I begged Luis to give me a rest day and to see if I improved. And I took a rest day. I actually put quite a lot of pink lipstick on to disguise my blue lips. And um, took a rest day. And luckily, Luis had to go home for Christmas. So I then went to the summit with Ang Dorji Sherpa. Doctors say it takes the human body six months to recover from an Everest climb. And here I was, not just seven months later, I'd climbed six different mountains, six different continents. I'd raised the money. I'd come straight from three weeks in Antarctica. And I was climbing this mountain too fast, and I was not acclimatized. So after eight hours of climbing... I mean, I'd physically blown off my feet twice. Um, I collapsed on the summit of Aconcagua. I could not move. I had made the fatal mistake you should never make in mountaineering. I'd misjudged my physical limits. I did not know that I could get back down. So I lay there for what seemed like an eternity. I mean, and Georgie couldn't carry me. We're the same size and weight. He was tired. Um, and for me to morally say that you have climbed a mountain... You have to go up and you have to go down using your own power. You cannot be carried. You cannot be towed. You haven't climbed a mountain if you do that. So I knew I had to get back down. I managed to get down two carbohydrate gels. And luckily, I was able to move under my own power. I was one of the lucky ones. I came away with my life. But I had to go straight to hospital in Buenos Aires to be treated for frostbite in my hands and feet. I then waited four months for the earliest, safest time that I could conceivably climb Alaska. When I got to the summit of Denali, I couldn't believe that the goal I'd set myself 360 days earlier had actually happened. It was one of those moments in time where you look out over the Alaskan mountain range and you just want to freeze the frame. All the blood, sweat and tears I'd shed the past, the, you know, the past year, 
all condensed into one intense moment. I had I'd achieved my goal. My happiness was short-lived. I woke up the next morning to find the bodies of two neighboring climbers lying dead next to my camp. Um, sorry, I've got a time thing. Um, I came away from that mountain thinking, climbing mountains like life. It's so much about yourself, about what you learn, the lessons that you learn, not all about getting to the summit. Let me just see if my pictures are working. No. Um, any pictures? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> we skipped one. But um, I did not uh, shower for the entire seven weeks that I was on Everest. And this is my once a fortnight hair washing session. I just had an issue with having the Sherpas collect snow to melt water so we could shower. So I didn't shower for seven weeks. I had to battle my inner demons every single day on Everest to overcome my fear of heights. And the worst thing for me by far was the Kumbu Ice Fall, 3,000 feet of vertical over ladders of which you cannot see a bottom. But I knew that if I was going to climb Everest, I had to do everything in my power to make that happen. And that meant I had to get across those crevasses. So what did I do? I got down on my knees and I crawled across those ladders. And after m numerous trips in the icefall, multiple ladder crossings, my knees looked like raw pieces of meat. But I didn't care. That is what got me to the summit of Everest. And it's true. Facing your fears definitely makes you stronger. Now, here's some video footage, I hope, of me <laughs> on uh, a, a very short ladder crossing. Mount Everest has killed many climbers who are stronger and more experienced than Annabelle. And she knows it. It's like she's trying to run before she can even walk. People often ask me, what is it that... <laughs> Thank you. What is it that drives you? What is it that makes you go into the death zone and become part of a statistic? Well, there's lots of things that drive you at different times on a mountain. I wanted to make mum and dad proud of me. I wanted to prove that everyone that said I couldn't, that I could. But upon reflection, there is only one real answer. And that is, you learn to respect yourself. And with that respect comes an inner confidence that enables you to deal with all life's obstacles that comes your way. You know, whether it be a divorce or whether it be losing your job or in my case, a single mother. I know that I will get through my problems because I've been to a much harder place. Here is some video footage that shows some of the challenges I faced on Everest. I tell myself a lot that I can do this, that other people have done it and I've definitely got the strength and the ability to do it. Headed toward Camp 3. Every climber on Mount Everest comes face to face with the cold, hard reality of death. Annabelle Bond pays respect to the mountain and the fallen. Um, I've just seen my first dead body, and I'm not really enjoying that experience. As a matter of fact, I'm finding it really off-putting. Camp three couldn't come soon enough in my eyes. I guess I'll keep going. I'm tired. On the icefall's final ladder. Annabelle is clipped in with two safety lines. Still, it doesn't exactly feel safe. It's hard to enjoy yourself in this environment, even when you should feel thrilled. Annabelle's team is in first place, and she is in position to be the first woman to summit this year. But is she happy? I'm just torture. And it's just pounding in there. It's freezing. I want to get some sleep before we leave at 10 o'clock tonight to try and summit. We're actually waking up at 8. Uh, you can see the lack of oxygen in the air. Um, I'm very happy to be here and I'm scared about what tomorrow entails. Annabelle is dying right now. Everyone at this altitude is. As a murderous wind rips through the Buddhist prayer flags at Camp 4, Annabelle sits in her tent, defying the skeptics. So here we are, the eve for one of the biggest days of my life. Um, yeah, I'm a little teary. I'm nervous. Um, 
I really want to do it. Um, I know it's going to be hell. It's going to be pushing through a pain barrier, which I don't think I've ever done before. And wish me luck. That's all I have to say. I wish all of our team luck. My year of climbing was an unbelievably challenging year. I climbed 150,000 feet of vertical. That is four times the cruising altitude of a jumbo jet. That's somewhere up where Felix jumped off his balloon. Um, I spent five months in a tent. It was, my body goes into convulsions when I see, hear orange flapping canvas. Um, I was a logistical nightmare. I endured extreme heat, extreme cold, and I had the misfortune to see two people die on Denali. But I remain committed to my goal. With determination, focus, perseverance, the love and support of my family, I was able to achieve the unimaginable. There is nothing unimaginable about all of us here, setting our goals high and challenging all our energies into achieving it. So if the girl that's terrified of heights can climb the tallest mountain in the world, just think of what every single one of you can do if you put your mind to it. Here's my summit day footage. Maybe not. <laughs> Hello. Oh. I knew I had one shot. Ultimately, it's your legs that have got to get you up there. It's legs and lungs. That's the two things that take you to the summit. Annabelle Bond has made it to the Hillary step. Here, she must play Russian roulette with the safety lines. If she picks the wrong one, she could die. I can't actually believe that I'm here, and I'm just trying not to get too nervous. Annabelle is higher than any other mountaintop in the world. To her right, she has an awesome overview of the Himalayas. Straight above her, she has just 60 vertical meters to go until the summit. To her left, is a deadly drop-off that plummets for more than a kilometer. With their teammates proudly waiting for them, Annabelle and Andronica take their last few steps to glory. It's been the most bonding thing with the team. I think that's to go through an experience like this together. We've all cried, we've all, you know, laughed. Just being on the top there is something I'll never, ever forget. It's the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Annabelle is ecstatic, but she's on the most inhospitable piece of land on Earth. Getting up Mount Everest is just half the battle. She still has to get back down, alive. Most people are in shock that I've made it. I don't think people can believe <laughs> that I've actually done it, which is a nice thing. It's, it's good to surprise people rather than to have them expect you to do it. Thank you all very much.